Yeah, my name is uh, Ljosha Hafner. Um, I'm a physicist by education. Uh, I did my PhD in, uh, uh, in France in a uh, large uh, neutron source. It's basically a huge nuclear reactor. Um, where, uh, why I'm telling you this is because you will be listening about this for the next hour and a half. Um, but not only this particular institute, but uh, there is a whole family of uh, institutes, uh, so-called research infrastructures that, uh, that give access to, to various researchers that we call users. Um, and these users, they will actually use our facilities to perform many kinds of experiments. And, uh, and uh, during this hour and a half, um, I will walk you through a bit uh, what kind of uh, research we perform first, uh, what kind of data we, we acquire, what kind of data we gather, uh, how, how the data is exploited traditionally or before how it was done in the past and uh, how it's uh, how where we are slowly moving to uh, and what is even uh, the word panosk uh, and how it's related to to eosk uh, so first uh, let's see the table of contents i already briefly explained but um, uh, first i'll give a small introduction into all the buzzwords uh, if, if there is anything unclear or you have some questions, just uh, interrupt me at any point. Uh, I think it's better if we do it on, on the fly than, uh, than waiting until the end, going back all the slides. Uh, then we will take a look at the current state, how, how researchers are, are um, working with this data, uh, what it takes even to, to perform such experiments. Uh, then uh, we have to speak about PANOSC, Photon and Neutron Open Science Cloud. It's one of the constituents of, of the future EOSC, uh, directed towards this photon and neutron community. Uh, then I will speak about uh, fair data and implementation, maybe a bit more in, from practical terms, how, how we tackle this, how we try to uh, make our process more fair. Uh, not too much from the theoretical perspective, but uh, what we implemented, what we developed, and uh, what kind of uh, other, let's say, soft developments were also needed. Uh, then we will take a look at the data analysis, some examples. Then uh, come the catalogs, the data catalogs, and uh, the federated search engine. Uh, finally, I have some assignment for you where you can... Uh, check a bit how, how it works, you can do it. Uh, now, if you will not be too interested, we can do it together or um, you will see there is some nice uh, website and you can search through the data and so on. Uh, and in the end, I prepared some short quiz for you. Um, you will not be like penalized or anything, but I have some uh, prizes uh, for, for the winners. <laughs> um, Okay, so, so let's start with this. I mean, usually we, we, we show this to prospective users, so it's not like some uh, um, children yeah, video. Or Sarek Eric is a unique pan-European research infrastructure. It brings together into a super laboratory facilities made available by eight countries in Europe for research in all fields of materials and life sciences. Each participating country contributes to Sarek, a state-of-the-art research facility. The analytical techniques available through Sarek provide deeper knowledge about the structure, dynamics and composition of materials present in a range of products, from pharmaceuticals to batteries. CEREC, by creating a synergy across borders and scientific fields, provides researchers with a unique tool to meet challenges in research and innovation and to tackle emerging issues in society. 
This integrated multidisciplinary infrastructure is open to researchers and companies from all over the world. Access to this integrated facility is merit-based, granted by international competition. Researchers winning the competition can access, with a single proposal, over 50 cutting-edge instruments combining NMR, electron, ion, neutron and photon-based techniques, allowing to perform analysis and synthesis of complex materials. In exchange for free access, researchers are required to publish their results. The submission process is in two steps. Pre-submission allows evaluation of the proposal by expert scientists and technicians at the facilities who can also assist in improving it. Final submission leads to the final evaluation. The CEREX offer has been met with enthusiasm and interest by the research community worldwide. Received projects are focused on a wide variety of topics. The scientific results of CEREC users have been published in top-rated international journals. CEREC aims to make its network of facilities accessible also by industry, combining standard methods with cutting-edge analytical techniques. This allows contributing to the technological development and industrial competitiveness of Europe, bringing together research and industry. CEREC is committed also to education, with projects targeting pupils and students from high school to PhD level. Communication through dissemination and outreach activities are a core value, allowing scientific knowledge to be spread to expert and lay publics. So this is like uh, an introduction video for for um, for our uh, our institute, and now uh, I have another video for you. Uh, specifically, we tackle some uh, some particular uh, topics, focal topics of interest, uh, among others, for example, battery research and and uh, fuel cells in this sense. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. Societies worldwide need the paradigm shift towards renewable energy to mitigate the impact of human activities on global climate. The intermittent nature of most renewable energy sources implies the intermediate storage of the excess energy produced in low consumption periods to use it during peak hours. Batteries can help us to do so. Advances in battery design have made modern technology possible, but this is not enough. The need for energy storage capacity will increase rapidly in the near future. We need more efficient, energy dense and greener batteries. Since its invention by Alessandro Volta, a battery is made of three main components. A positive electrode, commonly called cathode, a negative one called anode, and the electrolyte ensuring the charge equilibration between them. Scientists have been focusing on each of these components to improve the technology, making batteries greener, cheaper and more durable. 
The expected implementation of batteries at a large scale implies addressing several issues related to the availability of their components. For some applications, new technologies where lithium is replaced by other common metals such as sodium or potassium are developed. At the cathode side, the replacement of cobalt by more common and widespread elements such as manganese and iron, or even sulfur, is also essential. Security remains a non-negotiable requirement, and the need for batteries with higher energy performance is pushing the development of new all-solid-state devices based on solid electrolytes. CERIC is a multidisciplinary research infrastructure bringing together some of the most advanced analytical facilities in Europe to deliver innovative solutions to societal challenges in energy, health, food, cultural heritage and more. It provides scientists and companies worldwide a single entry point to over 50 advanced analytical techniques allowing structural investigations of material. The available NMR, electron, ion, neutron and photon-based techniques allow scientists to analyze energy materials and establish a clear relationship between their structure and properties. Each battery element can be analyzed to gather information on the local structure, element distribution, electronic properties and more. Our techniques can be applied, in some cases, to study the complete device and by applying an electric bias, it is possible to study a battery in real operation conditions. CERIC continuously improves available instruments to offer the best research tools. The infrastructural development is complemented with investments in research by supporting different PhD projects in energy research. Visit our website to join the Energy Challenge. Okay. Um, well, these are two nice videos that our communication department produced, um, but it somehow gives uh, a very brief introduction into into uh, what our content looks like, right? So the content of of uh, CERIC in this case, and then also as we will see, photon and neutron community, um, it all revolves around uh, properties of matter. So uh, we have some sort of a sample, some sort of material. It can be protein, it can be a new type of material. We put it into our instrument and then we gather data. And this amount of data is growing and uh, there is a lot of experiments uh, being performed each year, all the time. Uh, and this is actually why we are here today, right? Uh, to, to where I will speak about the, the Open Science Cloud and how it's related to, to this community. So, uh, as already mentioned, uh, CERIC is a consortium of eight institutes from eight countries. Uh, this, uh, these uh, institutes, they contribute part of their, um, of their research to us. Uh, and we operate uh, according to user facility model. This means that twice a year, we organize an open call to, to our users, actually to, to anyone. Uh, and then uh, the users will apply. They have to uh, submit a very condensed uh, but very detailed proposal, what they want to do, how long they want to measure, and which instrument they want to use. And then, of course, what will be the outcomes. Uh, and uh, they always uh, have to apply to at least two techniques at the same time. So this is uh, how CERIC is interdisciplinary by, by default. Um, out of, uh, out of uh, uh, all the research infrastructures that we have, CERIC is just one. So there are many research infrastructures, and what I uh, put here is actually a screenshot of uh, what uh, EU says are research infrastructures. And there are many different uh, research infrastructures. It's, it's already in our name, uh, CERIC, ERIC. ERIC is a new type of, of uh, business, new type of institute in Europe, which means uh, European Research Infrastructure Consortium. 
so limited uh, whatever, right? And then there is also Eric. Uh, and one of them is uh, Seric. Then we have, uh, for example, here in this photo, uh, this is a huge neutron source that they are building in Sweden. This is like more than one billion investment. And uh, <laughs> there are already buildings by now. Uh, but it's a very long process, uh, and it will be the largest neutron source in the world. Um, then we have Elixir. This is uh, another ERIC, which is a collection of institutes. They are focused towards biology. Uh, I don't know now how many um, institutes are joined there. Uh, and then finally, we have this uh, bottom uh, right picture. Uh, where there are all the synchrotrons. Synchrotrons, as was mentioned, are, are sources of X-rays. Uh, and they are all huge particle accelerators with uh, around 30 to 40 simultaneous experiments happening. Um, so uh, we're still in the introduction. I mean, maybe I'm uh, boring you a bit with this, but I would like you to, to just keep these things in mind because, uh, because after all, uh, our project uh, is also called PANOSC, right? So, um, <coughs> so we, were, we are speaking about photon and neutron sources. Uh, photon sources are synchrotrons and free electron lasers. So there are around 15 synchrotrons in Europe, and there are maybe just two or three free electron lasers in Europe, and 10 in the world, or even less. So it's even more exclusive club. Uh, then we have neutron sources. They are either reactors or spallation sources. The one I showed you in Sweden will be a big spallation source. Um, they differ in the physical uh, process that they use to generate neutrons. And neutrons are even more complicated because, um, because it's very difficult to produce neutrons in the lab, where X-rays, uh, you know, it's re relatively easy to produce them, right? You can go to, to a physician, and then they will take some uh, radiography of yours. Or This is very similar, just that it's much bigger and much better. Um, and then uh, finally, our applications, they are always directed towards the structure and uh, properties of matter, either static, so static structure of something frozen or um, whatever, or time resolved, meaning that uh, we are observing some, uh, some kind of a phenomenon, like uh, how a protein will react to a given substance or uh, how something reacts uh, with respect to temperature change or pressure change or solvent and so on. Uh, and these applications, they really range from, from uh, <laughs> these are not buzzwords now. These applications actually range from fundamental physics to all the way to archaeology, to art restoration. Um, you know how to analyzing the, the painting in the vertical direction, what are the layers, how to remove only the top layer during the restoration process, and what kind of uh, solvents to use, and so on. And uh, in, in very, very general terms, our experiments always look like this, right? We have some source here, then we have some optics, with the optics, we shape the source, the, the position, the size of the beam uh, to, to have uh, nice properties when it hits the sample. The sample is what we are investigating. And then finally, we detect here the scattered light um, uh, on some detector. And then this is actually our raw, raw data, right? Uh, and now already, now you can start to, to to think about the abstract uh, way of how to how to describe this experiment, how to make it reusable, right? So in order to make this data reusable, we must record or have the knowledge of all these three, four uh, major components, right? If we only have the raw data, we don't know anything because we don't know what was the sample, what was and so on. So our task in this uh, PANOSC is actually to, to identify these components and to see what can be 
completely standardized among all facilities, what can be standardized per domain, uh, and then finally also implement it, right? So <coughs> here I'm showing a general experimental flowchart at a user facility. So the users are your professors, right, in universities. This is, uh, we call them users, but mostly this is the professor and their two students, right? Um, they will basically perform various experiments in their laboratory. Uh, and, then, and then when they find out that their devices aren't sufficient anymore uh, and that they are on the verge of something a bit bigger or something like that, they will uh, try to use our infrastructure uh, in order to, to get those results and then analyze them. So from the start of, uh, of the idea, to actually performing an experiment, there is usually at least one year of time. Uh, at least one year passes before, uh, before someone can actually come to a, to, to, to a facility and perform the experiment. Um, and what they will have to do in the meantime is they will have to perform all kinds of experiments uh, in order to support the submission in this competition, in this open call. Uh, and uh, then finally be successful also among their peers because some domains are more uh, attracted, uh, attractive, more de uh, in demand. Uh, and then they can perform the experiment. And then the experiment usually takes anywhere from six hours to one week or two weeks. And during this time, uh, the users will have 24 hour availability of the device. Uh, during which they can do whatever they want, right? But uh, everyone will stay there 24 hours uh, or at least more or less um, gather all the data they can uh, because infrastructure is completely overbooked and uh, the so-called beam time, this is the experiment, is very limited. Uh, so it can take years to actually get access uh, and when you do, then it, of course, gets easier for those that are um, regular users. They know how to prepare experiments. They know what to do and so on. Uh, I mean, this is, there is no bias towards these people. But since we are overbooked, right, we want to maximize our time as well uh, as an institute. That means that, Again, you can see the benefit of, of, of uh, making this data available is that new potential users can actually get some glimpse of the data uh, even without doing the experiment, for example, or analyzing the data if they had the same experiment in mind, right? Um, so uh, after the experiment is done, um, you know, the experiment is just some bunch of pixels. On, on a detector, there is nothing there. Uh, so first we need to go through a step which is called data reduction. It means that we take all the knowledge we know of the experiment, the optics, the source, uh, the sample, and so on, and uh, put this into some small algorithm uh, and reduce this data, basically going from these pixels to some curve to some graph of something, right? Uh, as I said before, um, the change in thickness of this part of the protein with respect to temperature. So finally, we'll get temperature and this quantity here. This is called data reduction. Uh, and then the users can do data analysis and finally go into the publication if the data was great or good. And average time from performing the experiment to publication, and if we include even this part here, is up to three years. So uh, you can see why we want to avoid um, repeating experiments, because we forgot that someone prepared, performed it 10 years ago or five years ago. We want to avoid experiments that don't produce a publication, so meaning that even if the original team didn't produce a publication, maybe someone else can, opening the data. 
and then furthermore uh, make everyone a regular user right to 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 have very good experiments uh, this, these are now some drawbacks. Uh, these are now some obstacles that uh, our users currently face when, uh, when trying to perform such experiments. So, as you see, uh, as you saw before, right? Uh, there are like 20 synchrotrons or 15. Then there are the neutron sources and so on. But if a user wants to get an experiment, they can apply only uh, only once to one. If they find out, and you know the community is not so large, so it can be the same reviewer in two in two institutes. If they fi find out that you applied twice with the same experiment, you, you're automatically disqualified. So, first thing is that uh, everything is custom, everything is unique, everything is individual, right? So, what we uh, what the community wants to do now is to somehow unify the process so that you will be able to. This is the the also the unique value proposition of CERIC, right? CERIC allows you to submit one proposal, and we have two synchrotrons and one neutron source and several other instruments, right? Um, and then, of course, there are technical obstacles like uh, the users must have accounts for each institute and they have to wait so they are approved and right and you're doing everything last minute so um, <coughs> when <laughs> when you actually perform the experiment, uh, then everything is custom. You will record in a custom data format. Sometimes it will be ASCII. Sometimes it will be a binary. Uh, and and then all the all the data analysis process is also very complex. Um, and uh, this all brings to this long time from experiment to publication. And uh, moreover, many experiments, as I said, never produce uh, any publication. Uh, <coughs> So the latest effort into making life easier for our users is the PANOSC project, Photon and Neutron Open Science Cloud. It is also one of the pilot projects of EOSC. Uh, it will end uh, in November 2022, so this year in a few months. Uh, and the main goal is uh, making fair data reality for the PAN community, for the neutron community. Uh, the, the participants are uh, the following, so CERIC, ESRF, the Europe's uh, world's biggest synchrotron, ILL, world's biggest neutron source, ELI, uh, it's a new kind of ERIC, new institute located in Romania uh, and Hungary, it's a laser source, uh, then we have uh, EGI, this is the computing infrastructure in Europe. And finally, we have the XFEL, uh, free electron laser, and ESS, the future big neutron source, right? Um, in order to, to, to make this happen, uh, the work is uh, split into six technical work packages. So uh, uh, data policy and data stewardship, uh, before we can do any kind of implementation and, and such things, we need to have all the policy framework in place. Uh, then we have the data catalog services. Um, this is actually what you will be using further down this uh, lecture. Then we have the data analysis services, the simulation services, virtual neutron X-ray laboratory. Uh, there is a work package dealing with EOSC integration, how this will then feed into the complete European Open Science Cloud. The sustainability, so who will pay for it, what's the business model behind after Panos cans. Uh, and finally, we have this uh, staff and user training module, which uh, also organized similar summer school to yours. So. <coughs> The timeline of, of uh, verification goes way back. Uh, it actually goes to 1994, they claim. Uh, this is when there was first uh, 
there was a first draft of a new kind of data format, a new kind of uh, also metadata format ontology, which we call Nexus. And uh, the Nexus format is supposed to be uh, uh, something that you get when you measure something in our <laughs> institute. And for many techniques, for many experiments, in many institutes, this is already a reality. Already, I mean, it's been a long time since 1994, right? Uh, but there are still techniques where, where you will just get a spreadsheet of stuff and then it's up to you and your email to, to figure out what to do. Uh, the first European project uh, of similar type was called PANDATA. Um, this was from 2009 to 2014. And during this project, uh, something very cool happened. So they unleashed uh, Umbrella ID service. This is a uh, authentication and authorization uh, provider. So the identity with which you can, in principle, uh, access any kind of website or you know, the proposal and so on in all these uh, institutes that are part of it. So this is already in place since 2011. Uh, and then there were more projects. So Calypso Plus was one. This was uh, more directed towards uh, acquiring new users, uh, how users interact with the, with the whole process, how to make the process easier. And finally, we have uh, Panosk, which is uh, specifically targeted at international research infrastructures and the Expands, which is targeted at national uh, research infrastructures, but they are very similar. So I'm sure you you, you saw this many times uh, during this week. Um, and this is, uh, I don't know, probably one of the seminal publications now. Um, <coughs> So how do we how do we actually go with uh, implementation of this fair digital object, right? Um, what I explained you so far, I think it's a lot of uh, relatively scattered information about all kind of uh, parts of the process. But uh, but this is also how Panosk works because because the work uh, behind making a open science cloud which will actually be useful to the researcher is quite big. Uh, it will require almost each uh, individual experiment to be um, standardized into some way, the ontology to be defined, and then this will have to be integrated into how, how the uh, institutes as such work. Uh, <coughs> so first, uh, we have the the digital object, uh, which contains our uh, raw data. And then in order to, to understand what this raw data is, uh, we need to have rich and uh, relevant metadata, right? Uh, <coughs> and then when we have this metadata, we can uh, then finally uh, have basically the metadata stored and uh, equipped with some identifier. Uh, and then through the catalog, we can, we would be able to access this data. Um, I have to speak now a bit more technically about uh, this Nexus format, uh, because uh, because I think it's very important uh, to to understand that in when you are doing some experiments in a laboratory, right? The the original way or the the most basic way is actually having a notebook, writing down the values every so, uh, every now and then, right? Every minute, every five seconds, and so on. And then we can uh, uh, digitize this and have the computer record these values for us every 10 milliseconds or one millisecond or whatever. Uh, but we still end up just with a spreadsheet. And then if the spreadsheet is sufficiently large, if there is a lot of data, um, you know, think of a process uh, we're recording every, um, I don't know, nanosecond for a while, right? For for a few minutes. Uh, is the data set will get immense. Uh, 
so that's why we are using this kind of a binary HDF5 file. And then this HDF5 file can be equipped with uh, very rich metadata. So we would uh, group um, the recorded data into first into an investigation and then into an experiment because this follows very nicely with what the users will submit. You know, the proposal is one investigation and there can be several experiments inside. And then inside of that, we have the data sets that are, for example, um, the measurements, the experimental setup information, the sample information, uh, which can themselves be measurements um, because this is not limited to text or um, it can be further, further raw data of the sample and so on. And then we have uh, another part here, uh, which then belongs to the analysis. And this way, uh, we are able to, to basically track the changes in the, in the file and what the user did. Uh, and finally, uh, the end goal would be that if, if a data set is published, if the measurements are used for publication, someone will be able to go back and repeat the whole process, right, uh, almost automatically uh, without any, any expert knowledge. Um, and then this opens a whole new way of, you know, using AI on this data and so on. Um, and this is what, what we have implemented with uh, specific techniques. Uh, <coughs> so the two critical components of this FAIR implementation. This happened in the beginning of PANOSC, uh, were the uh, acceptance of a data policy. I'm sorry, I don't have an abstract of our data policy here now, but, uh, but the main outtakes are um, everyone doing the experiment will have to make the data open. Uh, there is a certain embargo period, which is set to three years. Uh, it's not a coincidence, right? So. If after three years you haven't published the anything, uh, then you lose the unique right to your data. So someone else can access the data and uh, maybe publish something on their own, right? Um, <coughs> and then with each uh, experiment, there must be a data management plan. So the data policy governs all these abstract things, how long is the embargo, what, who is the custodian of the data, how is the data stewardship process managed. And then the data management plan will actually specify uh, where, where the stuff will be stored, how long, uh, and so on. And this then goes over all these fair uh, categories. So uh, the data must be findable. Uh, you will search in catalogs. Uh, it has to be uh, equipped with some identificators. In our case, we use DOI, Digital Object Identifier. Uh, and then we use two, let's say, competitive techniques. Some institutes use a normal uh, structured database, which is, uh, has been now developed into some sort of a package called ICAT. Uh, and some... Um, Facilities will use the non-structural database approach. This is, for example, the catalog called Invenio, um, if you ever heard of it. Uh, and then this will use a bit more flexible um, way of searching through the metadata. So instead of predefining everything, trying to find out all the possible ontologies in advance, you are a bit more free to, to use uh, free text uh, metadata and use these elastic search techniques or something. Uh, then the data must be accessible. Uh, this means we have to take care of short and long-term data storage. So uh, the experiments can be anything from a few megabytes to petabyte. Uh, this is our whole library, to terabyte. Um, and for that, we have like uh, we have online on-premise storage. This would be some sort of a network drive that we keep uh, on all the time, and everyone that has the permission can access NFS. Uh, then, for long-term storage, we have a backup uh, to a tape library, 
uh, this is also automated I think after 10 years or yeah I'm, I'm not sure uh, and then uh, and then on top of that uh, for some scalable experiments and so on we might use also cloud storage uh, meaning like if there is some sudden need for a lot of storage or a lot of computing power and so on um, in order for the these digital objects to be interoperable we use standard data formats what I said before Nexus there is something else called OpenPMD as well uh, then metadata formats the ontologies uh, and then specific data analysis programs they can actually you import this file inside and they will already pre-fill everything for you and you can go straight to analysis and finally, uh, one of the most important things that we shouldn't forget, to make stuff reusable, we need to have rich and extensive metadata. This means that we need to go away from paper notebooks for logs uh, to electronic logbooks, of course, uh, because only they can be searchable and so on. So this is how it looks like. <laughs> you know, this is uh, curated a bit. So there is lots of programs, lots of windows, lots of stuff, right? And one of the efforts where we spent a lot of time is to try to go away from this, right? To For the user to log into a website where the data is and then use some online tools to, to analyze this data. Um, I, will, I will show an uh, example um, later. So this is the whole circle, right? Um, so from acquisition, we go, what I said before, from these pixels to some curve, data reduction. We do quality control only after that, if, whether the data is fine, whether or not, uh, artifacts. Then we do the data analysis findings and finally if, if successful we can do the publication now I will show you two examples of um, of, of um, programs that we we put in place for our users so uh, they are both like some sort of pro pro examples but I, I would like you to see how easy it is actually to to use it uh, before right these are all programs that are Maybe you heard of uh, GitHub or some repositories. You have to go there. You download. You install. Nothing works. You have to install that library. This library. Now it's very easy. You go to a website. You log in, and there it is, right? You don't know about anything else. What's happening behind? And we took care of all kind of scaling the computing and so on. This will be the first example, Atsas, um, and uh, we make. Uh, made this program available to our users uh, according to this software as a service SAAS model. Uh, and then the other one I will show you is called Rafik. Uh, this uh, basically allows a user to use um, any kind of GUI programs, graphical user interface, simply in the browser. Um, I have screenshots here. I think it's fine. Um, so basically, you go to, to some uh, address. You click Login. And then, as you can see, um, either you have a local account or you can use this umbrella ID that I said before. Uh, so it can be anyone that already performed an experiment. And then uh, there is some very simple interface. Um, you see, you, you, you select stuff, you submit the job, and then, uh, and then you can investigate this. I mean, the, the point is not to look at these uh, numbers. And so actually, I don't even know what the experiment is about. But the point is that, that this somehow starts to be very easy. And, uh, and all the stuff, right? I mean, you still need to have knowledge of data quality after this, but you are already presented with this, uh, with the end result. 
uh, instead of learning everything, learning the program and so on. And I think, I mean, wh why I'm spending so much time on this, I think this will be one of the critical benefits of, of European Open Science Cloud for the researcher, because the researcher doesn't care about the re reusability or findability of their data. They care about publications, right? I have five publications in this year, impact factor and so on. But this is a benefit. So if these things are easier, if these things are more uh, streamlined, I mean, I know this might be a bit, you know, we, we don't say it. We don't say these things usually. But, but in order for the researchers to adopt these tools, there needs to be some benefit for them. I mean, they might uh, adopt, right? But you saw what's the timeline of efforts in, in, in this community. More than 20 years, more than 25 years, right? Uh, of, of effort. Uh, and not too many people are using it. Not too many people, you know. Still, you get logbooks and it's sample A, B, C, D. Okay. Uh, and and uh, these these things this can then uh, help with 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 the adoption. So the second example is this uh, Rafik. Um, this is our uh, very very boring ugly portal for for users. Um, this is how it looks like. Uh, basically, the users will have some uh, category, my applications. Uh, they go there, and then uh, and then they can start. For now, we have these two. Uh, you see, there are also these Jupyter notebooks. Maybe you heard about this. It's a very useful way of uh, working with Python code, uh, also in a collaborative way, and. Uh, I think also because of these benefits, uh, the community will somehow transition to this. If the analysis is in Python, then uh, we'll transition slowly to this. Then simply I open this, and I get to this. Uh, this is some program I ran there. But uh, you see, I'm still in the browser. I'm using something uh, specific, which, uh, which otherwise I would have to install and understand and so on. Um, so purely based on my username, permissions, credentials, and so on, I can uh, use the, the resources and, and so on uh, to perform my work. Um, do you want to make a break? Or I'm just speaking a lot. Sorry. <laughs> It's OK. OK. Uh, so these are, these are the Panosk partners. Uh, <coughs> you know, institutes are like sport clubs. No sport club will admit that, you know, whoever, let's say football, uh, okay, it's hard. Uh, you have some preferences, but uh, what I want to say is like, you know, uh, um, no sport club will admit that there is a better club, even if they are in like the third league. No one will like tell you, ah, but uh, whoever, uh, Real Madrid is the best. No one will say that, right? I mean, in reality. So institutes are similar, right? They will not tell you there is uh, another accelerator there where they are better. You can, of course, get the info one on one. But um, so it was clear from the beginning that the institutes will each go their own way, which is the best catalog for them, right? It's the same, basically. And not only catalogs, everything. They can't arrange uh, what will be the best technology, even if the differences are cosmetic, right? So. From the start, Panosk uh, project anticipated this. And they said, look, use whatever you want to store this data and metadata, but you will uh, contribute your data with some federated search. Uh, at that time, it was this API. And now we have this federated search portal, right? So 
you will maybe you will use it now i don't know with the time but um uh, maybe you will use it on your own now or i will just show it to you but uh, you will see there is a nice portal that uh, aggregates this information makes them searchable and then when you will click on the on the on the data set or the entry uh, you will actually go to that ugly page of, for example, of Seric, or, or someone else has a f fancy one. Or, uh, and again, um, important thing to note is that access to this is uh, governed by the data policy, and the data management plan actually specifies after uh, this time we will move the data there, and then since data policy says it has to be open, uh, the data will become open, right? Um, <coughs> and then over all of this, there is some, there are some data stewardship processes that um, I can't tell you too much about because they are still in progress or still developing. So how how exactly the data will be? how the quality of the data will be ensured from the beginning and so on. Uh, yeah, I went one slide too fast with my speaking. <laughs> so this is now, you see, uh, how these things that I was describing, how they come together, right? So, so you have this DMP, data management plan here. Uh, everything is governed by these access policies and data policy. Uh, and then you can see how how the data moves also to long-term storage uh, and how it can be yeah, accessed at any point and so on. Uh, so now we are going to, to, to let's say, third part uh, of, of this talk. Uh, this is now the federated search portal of PANOSC. This will become part of EOSC almost automatically um, when, when EOSC has this. Uh, so there is a very simple address, data.panosc.eu. There you can see its search bar. You search for a query and then you get the results based on how well they are matching. And then you can see here uh, which institute where the data was taken. Uh, and maybe, I mean, now I think you could try this assignment. I mean, I have some small assignment for you if you want. Um, to, to, to test this out a bit. Uh, basically, if you want to do the whole assignment, you will have to create uh, an account. Uh, maybe you can do it like four people in a group or five or something like that. Now, if you seriously dislike it, you can pursue me not to do it now. <laughs> if you will make uh, some account, I think you should try with umbrella ID first. Um, it's better. I mean, less uh, less information to provide. You can browse uh, as much as you want, but when you want to go to, to um, I will show you just now, basically. There is some sort of a wall at some point. No, no, there is a wall at some point, yeah. 
Yeah, did you did you somehow manage? I mean, saw like there is some search portal, and then you can search for queries, and then uh, basically you can see all this basic metadata, like who was the author, when it was uploaded, very short description, and so on. And uh, now, I mean, maybe we can do this together. I think. Now, now I would like to show you how it is actually uh, when when we find something, uh, <laughs> let's say, interesting. I mean, uh, there is one data set I would like to show you and then how all this functionality comes together, right? Um, so this has been uh, published by, by CERIC. Um, then I click on it. And then I'm redirected to our portal this is what I told you before right so there is the federated search but in case you want to do something then you will be redirected to the uh, said facility to, to, to do it right and uh, <coughs> we can read here a bit about what what this data set is who are the authors we can see their orchid uh, and then we have here the the DOI and also this data site uh, handle. Uh, and then in case I'm, uh, you see, I'm not cool enough yet. So here you could use, uh, you could use the umbrella system, you see, down here, or, uh, or I can use this uh, local. Uh, and then, <coughs> in the bottom, you see, you can either access this online storage. This will be just like uh, uh, HTTP server. You will get the files there. Or uh, you can use one of the tools that uh, was developed during Panosk. And this is some sort of a rich... Um, file browser uh, for for specifically for HDF files right so um, I think it's here so you can see we have uh, two two experiments one is uh, from this AFM atomic force microscope and then we have this um, x-ray microscopy you see I can uh, Browse the the files. And then, for example, this was recorded. This is not my data. I don't know the people who did it. Uh, it's open data. It's genuinely open data. And, and we can browse through their data set and the metadata is not rich enough yet and so on but but you see we're getting there we're even you can do it uh, non users uh, relatively easy you create an account you log in and and you can browse the data right i mean we we as i said the, the metadata is not rich enough but this is some sort of a glimpse how how it should look like right and then the next step would be um we, we do some sort of right click or whatever and say analyze this data set. We go in the previous uh, application I showed you this ATSAS, um, for example, and then and then this is how it's supposed to look like. I mean, it's it's actually it's quite cool, um, but it's uh, if you take a look at it just. Uh, uh, without any work and so on, then it's more like a moonshot project. I mean, uh, it's quite a big, big effort to bring together all the all the different techniques and 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 places and and researchers and so on. Um, I mean, I had here more more of these things, but uh, but maybe we can now go to the quiz. I mean. Uh, 
now you have to compete. The, have you heard of this Kahoot uh, thing? Yeah, I mean, probably better than me. <laughs> so uh, wait, now I have to. I think I'm, I mean, I think I'm on some free plan or something. So let's see how many people can actually, uh, how, how many are you here? 30 or, oh, 40. We will split the prizes a bit, okay. <laughs> so some of the questions are completely basic. Some of the questions are a bit more, you had to listen to me, I mean. Uh, I don't know. So, um, yeah, I don't know how many people can join. Maybe you can be in some groups, two or more, maybe, per lines. Let's see. Let's see, first come, first serve, and then you will group, okay? <laughs> oh. Anyone else? Ah. Perfect, then everyone join in. <laughs> so is there anyone else trying to go in? I used to say it, come on. <laughs> Can I start? That was the basic question. <laughs> Thibault. Okay. Yeah, read it again, okay? Because this is one of the take-home messages, no? <laughs> Oh. 
was it wrong? So I mean, uh, I mean the 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 excess rights. I mean, okay, uh, fine. Maybe uh, uh, I think that the excess rights are part of the data policy. No, uh, who can access and so on. And then the data management plan is like when this will happen, uh, you know, and such things. Or because you were so uh, unanimously against me. <laughs> okay. Don't worry, you can still win, I mean. Yeah, this uh, this is like this. Tatiana. There are 10 questions, but you will not get the prize, <laughs> you're the organizer. <laughs> Okay, now it's the last question, last chance. Okay, let's see the results now. Nasi. Nashi. Ah, sorry. Come here, come here. Yeah, yeah. A, A, A Chach, uh, whatever, D, B. Come here, come here. I Genuinely, I have some prizes for you. Batteries!
Ja, vse. Vse to. I mean, this, the three winners, they get all this small pack from us, no? Merchandise. Who are the two other? You are uh, Ah, no? <laughs> go on, go on. Take it. It was you, no? Sorry? It was you. I'm eight eight. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are still a few more, just take it, okay. Uh, yeah, do you know how to do you know how to check who was the worst? C can you come here? Yeah, one goes to the fourth also. No, the lucky loser, or how do you say? Sherlock. And then uh, we can give it to the last. Usama. Ah, this is not. Okay. Jojo. Yo-yo, Jojo. Phantoms, okay. Well, look, uh, there are two cables here from Seric and uh, this battery pack and some notebooks. Uh, please take it. Uh, yeah, I think with that we are done. I mean, uh, that's it, no? I think I would like you to remember just this, okay. Um, what are research infrastructures? They exist. Uh, Probably, I don't know exactly what you study, but probably you will have nothing to do with them, but, uh, but they exist, they are big institutes. They offer this time to, to, to users from everywhere on merit-based. Uh, then the data, data is managed according to data management plan and data policy. Since this data process analysis is very difficult, um, we are striving towards making it more transparent and easy. And this is what the role of EOSC should, should somehow be. No? And uh, I hope I convince you that we are doing something into this direction. Um, yeah, that's it.